to my talk entitled When Failure is Not an Option. Today I will be discussing the additions to the Apache Pulsar project that can help provide continuous availability to your applications that interact with Pulsar. My name is David Karamgard, and I am proud to be a committer on the Apache Pulsar project. I'm currently a developer advocate at Stream Native, the company behind Apache Pulsar. Previously, I was a principal software engineer at Splunk, where I worked on their Pulsar as a service team. I'm also the author of Pulsar in Action by Manning Press and co-author of Practical Hive by A Press. So as you can see, I have over a decade of experience with big data and streaming data systems. Developing a continuously available application requires more than just utilizing fault tolerant services such as Apache Pulsar in your software stack. It also requires immediate failure detection and resolution including built-in failover when there are data center outages. Up until now, Pulsar clients could only interact with a single Pulsar cluster and were unable to detect and respond to a cluster level failure event. In the event of a complete cluster failure, these clients cannot reroute their messages to a secondary or standby cluster automatically. This can lead to application failure, which, is, which for many is not an option. I want to begin by defining what availability is. Availability is usually measured in uptime, which in turn is measured by calculating the ratio of uptime to downtime within a year, and then expressing that ratio as a percentage. This is typically coined in the term of five nines, or an availability of 99.999% has been an industry and has been an industry gold standard for many years. Systems that can only survive failures at the hardware layer, including individual server outages, individual uh, software component outages, etc., are considered only fault tolerant, as shown here at the bottom. And they form the basis of the availability chain, or the very minimum requirement to be considered even available at all. Systems that can survive uh, an availability zone outage are then considered highly available. The next tier up in this ladder is having a highly available, highly available system. Things in this nature are handled by spreading your resources across multiple AZs and having redundant copies there so that if in the event of one zone goes down within a region, you're still able to function by using resources placed in another region, another availability zone within the same region. The ability to survive one or more regional outages reaches a level of con what's considered continuously available or the five nines gold standard that everyone is seeking to have. This allows, this ensures that your application is able to survive the complete loss of a regional data center through an event such as a network partition or other more catastrophic event and not have a prolonged outage. Now, when people use the term availability, they tend to think of only a platform availability as shown here, i.e. is the system up or down? This is because availability is generally considered a DevOps concern but it is also an application and data concern as well. One approach to providing high availability is to distribute the platform resources across different zones and or geographical regions. While necessary, this isn't sufficient for continuous availability. The data used by the system must be kept in sync across zones and regions as well. A system with a missing or incomplete data set is often worse than not having the system available at all as it can lead to incorrect information or duplicate processing of data, etc. From an application perspective, it is incumbent upon your application to be able to immediately detect a failure in the system and automatically switch over to the active platform in a seamless manner. Let's start with a quick review of all of Pulsar's availability features already available inside the platform prior to the 2.10 release. Starting with Pulsar's platform availability features shown here. Pulsar's multi-tiered design makes it highly available by default. We completely decouple the serving and storage layers as shown in, in this diagram. By separating these two layers, this allows Pulsar brokers to be 100% stateless. Consequently, any broker can serve data from any topic by reading that data from a separate storage layer instead of on a local disk. 
like many other messaging systems such as Apache Pulsar, or Apache Kafka rather. Additionally, stateless brokers that fail can be easily replaced with new broker instances without any additional setup processes required. Again, there is no need to copy data or ingest data onto local disk as this information is stored on a separate layer. Pulsar's storage layer also maintains multiple rep replicas of the data on different bookie nodes to ensure that the loss of one or more bookie nodes does not result in a loss of the data. From a data availability perspective, Pulsar's storage layer is self-healing. It will automatically detect any under-replicated data and recreate new copies of the data for you. This allows us to easy, easily replace any failed book bookies with new bookie instances and allow the self-healing mechanism to repopulate the new bookie with data for you. This ensures data availability within an individual cluster. Furthermore, Pulsar supports rack placement to ensure that it, at least one replica of the data in the storage layer is stored in a different availability zone within the same geographical regions. This feature ensures that there is highly available, uh, data is highly available within Apache Pulsar. Last but not least, Pulsar's geographic geo-replication mechanism allows you to asynchronously replicate data across multiple clusters to make, maintain consistent copies of the data sets between regions. These capabilities combine to provide continuous data availability within Pulsar. At the application level, Pulsar provides connection-aware clients that insulate the application from intermittent network outages. The Pulsar client automatically detects these network issues and reestablishes the connection rather than throw in an exception that, if uncaught, would cause the application to crash. This behavior is completely hidden from the application code and provides resiliency to broker failures at both the regional, or I'm sorry, at both the cluster and availability zone uh, layer. Prior to the 2.10 release of Pulsar, we were able to only provide continuous availability at the platform and data level, as shown here. Pulsar's geo-replication mechanism, as mentioned before, allows you to replicate the data across multiple geographical regions, ensuring that your data will be continuously available even in the event of a regional failure. Similarly, Pulsar's uh, platform architecture supports multiple clusters spread across different geographical regions, allowing you to uh, have a completely available Pulsar cluster up and ready in the event of a regional failure and switch over to that one. The one missing piece to the continuous availability story was the application layer. It can only achieve the level of highly available and not continuously available, thus making it the weak link in the chain. So what was missing prior to 2.10? Well, up until now, Pulsar clients could only interact with a single Pulsar cluster and were unable to detect and respond to a cluster level failure event. In the event of a complete cluster failure, these clients cannot reroute their messages to a secondary or standby cluster automatically. This would eventually lead to prolonged outages at the application layer. Prior to the 2.10 release of Pulsar, the best you could do was to provide a single static endpoint to your Pulsar cluster as shown here. Oftentimes this connection URL uh, to Pulsar is provided in, by a configuration file or similar mechanism, and this value is read once into the application when it initializes and this remains static the entire life cycle of the application. Then when a regional failure occurred, the best you could do was manually change the DNS entry for that URL to point to the standby cluster. So what was wrong with this approach? Well, obviously there's many things wrong with it. First and foremost, it requires your DevOps team to monitor the health of your Pulsar clusters and manually update the DNS record to point to the standby cluster when the active cluster is determined to be down. This, is not, this process is not automatic and the recovery time for a cluster outage is is wholly dependent upon the response time of your DevOps team. This requires a human to be alerted in the middle of the night, make these changes, understand what has to be done. This can take a long period of time to make this resolution. Even after the DNS record has been changed, 
it still takes some additional time for the DNS cache to be refreshed till you're ultimately your application is ultimately pointed back to the standby cluster and can recover from this from this regional outage. Starting with release 2.10 of Pulsar, we have added a new feature called failover clients that solves these types of problems. There are two distinct types of failover clients that are available in this release. The first is one that will automatically reroute your client connections to a different Pulsar cluster as soon as it detects a cluster outage. The second one allows you to trigger the failover through an exposed HTTP endpoint. This client will periodically invoke this exposed endpoint to get the correct connection details of the cluster it is supposed to connect to. This approach allows your, your admins to have more control over the failover process. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. But let's discuss the automatic failover client first. As the name implies, this failover client will automatically switch clients over to a designated standby cluster if and when it detects an outage on the primary cluster. This is accomplished by a probe task that periodically interrogates the primary cluster to determine if it's running or not. Once it has detected that the primary cluster is unavailable, it starts a timer to measure the length of the outage. This is to ensure that we don't inadvertently switch over due to a transient network issue that immediately resolves itself. We want to avoid switching rapidly back and forth between clusters as that is not a good approach for data consistency. If the outage continues for longer than the us a user configured duration, then the switchover occurs. Let's look at how this automatic failover client is configured and used in this code section here. We will reshow this during the demonstration, but I want to highlight a few points. The first thing to note is the creation of a separate set of authentication credentials for the secondary cluster. This is because your secondary cluster is most likely authenticated using a different at least set of credentials, if not mechanism entirely. These credentials must be hard coded and must be available for your client application to use at, at, uh, at compile time. This information must be available again, either through a configuration file or as hard coded here in this example. Next note that there are both a primary cluster URL property and a secondary URL cluster uh, property of the next two values shown here. The primary property obviously takes the broker URL of your preferred cluster connection while the secondary takes a list of one or more alternative clusters to connect to in the event of a failure. This allows you to have multiple standby clusters, which matches Pulsar's geo-replication capabilities to support multiple clusters as well. If you geo-replicate to five different clusters, you should be able to fail over to five different clusters. The failover delay property specifies how long the primary cluster outage must be before mass switching over to one of the standby clusters. This is the timer duration we discussed in the previous slide. The switch back property specifies how long the client waits to switch back to the primary cluster once it detects that the primary cluster is back up and running. In the, this is again for the scenario in which we switched over to the standby cluster. Please note that when you switch over to the standby cluster, the, the probe against the primary cluster continues to run even after we have performed the switch over. Once it detects that the primary cluster is back up and running, it will wait this long as specified again by that switchback delay to, to switch back over to the primary cluster. The check interval property controls the frequency at which the probe is executed. How frequently do we interrogate the primary cluster to determine if it's up or down? Finally, once this failover configuration has been constructed, we use that uh, to build a Pulsar client as shown here by specifying it in, a, in the service uh, provider, service provider uh, property as shown here, along with the authentication credentials for the primary cluster. Now let's discuss the controlled failover client. As the name implies, this client allows you to control when and where your Pulsar client will fail over to. This is accomplished by a REST service that you must implement. Let's look at the, how the control failover client is configured and used here. 
The first thing to note is the creation of a separate set of authentication credentials. These are for accessing the REST endpoint and not the standby cluster, which is different from what we saw in the previous slide. Please note that the REST service will be providing authentic any required necessary or should provide any necessary authentication credentials to your cluster for switching over. Next, note that the default service URL property takes the broker URL for your preferred cluster connection. Think of this as your primary cluster. The check interval show controls the frequency at which the REST endpoint is executed to get the connection URL it should be using. The URL provider property is where you specify the address of the REST service you have implemented, and the URL header is where you provide the contents uh, to be included in the HTTP header call. The header can be used to provide the authentication credentials as shown here. Again, you want to secure this endpoint because the data you will be, will be returning includes authentication credentials, which are sensitive information, i.e. potentially a JWT token that you don't want to have exposed to the world. Finally, this failover configuration is, again is used to build a Pulsar client as shown here by specifying it in the service URL provider uh, property as shown here. Let's, let's take a quick look at a simple example of the REST endpoint service that you must implement. Again, it is a single endpoint that you will hit. There's nothing uh, very unique about it, but note that the expected return type is a JSON object that contains the four data fields shown here. You can see that this JSON type by the produced annotation here at the top uh, where the media type is specified as application JSON. Also note that the information is generated dynamically in the code, so it can be, in theory, it can read this information uh, from a database, etc. The data structure allows, as shown here, allows you to specify all the necessary authentication credentials required to connect to any Pulsar cluster. This provides much more flexibility than the automated failover client, which requires you to provide a hard-coded list of broker URLs. In this example, I am forcing a switch over to a standby cluster based on the number of times the REST endpoint is called, and this is solely to demonstrate a failover to the standby cluster, and then back again, as you shall see. Next, I will demonstrate both of these failover clients in action. For those of you that are interested, the source code for this demo is available in the GitHub repo shown here. So what am I going to demo? I'm going to demo the automatic failover. For the first step, I will start an application that uses the application failover client to produce data to a topic. Next, I'm going to start consumers on both the active and standby clusters so that we can see that where the data is flowing in real time. Next, after some messages start flowing, I will stop the active Pulsar cluster, and we should observe the flow of data shift from the active to the standby cluster automatically, again, without any intervention on my part. This will be detected by the flow of data switching from the active consumer window to the standby cluster window. Finally, after some time, I will restart the primary cluster to demonstrate that the data will be switched back over to the primary cluster, and we should observe the flow of data shift back to the primary cluster. Let's start by reviewing the automatic failover demo code. As you can see here, it specifies a get client method, which is called by our data producer to figure out the connection details to the Pulsar cluster. We, you can see inside this get client method that we're using the auto cluster failover builder, and we specify a primary cluster of 127001 or localhost, Pulsar cluster running on localhost, and a standby cluster list contain, containing a single element of a Pulsar cluster running on a 192.168 IP address, and that maps to a Pulsar cluster running inside my Kubernetes environment on my local environment and my local network. The failover and switchback delay are both configured to be 10 seconds, and the check interval will specify to be one second. You can see by the base class here that we're publishing again to the public default failover topic, and the active broker's local host, and again the standby just to confirm is our Kubernetes cluster on 192. Now to get started, let's go ahead and start a Pulsar cluster in standalone mode by running the following command against the Pulsar code base. You can see a very 
busy and chattery startup mode, but when this is all completed, you should see uh, indication of a live equal true as a final statement to indicate successful startup of the Pulsar cluster in standalone mode on our local environment. Next, we'll start a Pulsar client uh, consumer on the same on the public default failover topic locally to be, to be able to see the messages coming in when they're published to this topic on the local host. Again, you can see we connected to the active cluster, but no messages are coming in because we're not running the, top, the topic as of yet. And also here we can see that the connection was indicated by some informational messages published in the Pulsar broker log. Next, let's verify in our Kubernetes cluster running in our environment that we do have an IP address of 192.168, which represents the Pulsar proxy in front of our Pulsar cluster, which is fine. It's where we're going to be connecting to. We'll log into a tool, tool set pod on this Kubernetes cluster and use that to start a Pulsar client again on the same topic to indicate when messages are coming over to the failover a standby cluster as shown here on that same topic. Again, currently no, no, message, no messages are coming in, so we see the consumer sitting here waiting for messages to come in. Next, we'll go ahead and start the automatic code base running this Maven command. Let that guy get started, and we should see the messages start flowing into localhost because that is the preferred uh, primary cluster. We can see some, again, some informational messages showing up that the connect producer is connected, and some messages are being published. And we can start to see the messages come in. Now let's go ahead and simulate a failure of this cluster by going ahead and killing the component and having, the, as we can see, there's a forced disconnect coming over on this client and then this, on, on the standby cluster, immediately we picked up where we left off. We can see the last message we received on this side was message 18. The producer went and continued to publish the producer message 19. So no messages were lost on the producer side. Messages are starting to flow here. As indicated, they will continue to flow through this message uh, flow over here until we're ready to start restart the topic. Now let's go ahead and restart this information here. And we should see after this topic come at the Pulsar cluster restarts, again by indicating live equals true. We should start seeing this connector reconnect and start consuming some messages as shown here. And sure enough, you can see we picked up where we left off on message 37 was the last one we received on the failover on the standby cluster and we received them again we started producing starting at message 38 and onward we're producing the messages so we've demonstrated starting out producing messages to local host saw the messages coming through we killed did a hard kill on the local pulsar cluster to simulate a, a, a geographical region our entire region failure outage saw the messages dynamically switch over automatically to the standby cluster and then when we restarted the Pulsar cluster on localhost, the active one again, that was detected and the messages began flowing back. The clients reconnected to the primary cluster and continued publishing messages. For the controlled failover, I need to first start the REST endpoint service. So I will show how that gets done. Next, I will start an application again that uses the controlled failover client to produce data to a topic. As before, I will start consumers on both the active and standby cluster windows so that we can observe in real time where the data is actually being published. Then using the code that we showed earlier, we will trigger the controller to switch to a different Pulsar cluster after approximately 20 messages. Uh, we should observe the flow of data shift from the active to the standby cluster as we did before. And then again, using that rest endpoint that we showed after a total of 50 messages have been sent, we should trigger the flow, the, the controller will trigger the flow back to the original active cluster to show, the, to show that you can dynamically switch back and forth uh, to multiple clusters. It's not a one-way operation. So let's start with the control cluster failover. As I showed in the slides, this is easily configurable by the control cluster failover builder, where we specify default service or preferred active broker URL here, which we will see is defined in the base class as our local host and there's also a standby cluster, but that is not specified here. Instead, we have this check interval set for every one second to invoke this HTTP endpoint specified here on localhost with the slash config URL, and I'll show you this example in a minute. We also pass in the header information here. This is used to build the Pulsar client. Before we get started, just wanted to show that there's a local Pulsar cluster running here, as mentioned, and we'll start a consumer on the, on the designated output target. 
topic. So here we're starting it locally. We'll also show that the standby cluster here is running on a separate node, a Kubernetes cluster running inside my local network that exposes this IP address where we connect, this 192.168.1.128. We'll go ahead and log into that tool set and we will execute the same consumer here to see where these messages actually are getting sent. So you can see they're both running, no messages are being sent at this point. Now let's switch gears and quickly look at the HTTP endpoint service that we've had configured. Again, as we showed in the previous example, this is exposing our local host in the slash config endpoint, which is again what we specified here. So this is the endpoint that will be executed. This is the code that will be executed. We're returning JSON and we're gonna output, monitor this information by returning a control configuration setting every single time. Uh, again, for the first zero to 20 messages, we're gonna, not re we're gonna return the local host, and then everything after the 50th time this is called, we'll go back to local host. For those 30 messages in between or so, every 30 invocations every second, we'll specify this Kubernetes cluster. So our expectation is that we'll start producing messages on the local host in this window here, and then after a period of time, they will switch over to here, and then eventually switch back. Again, this is all controlled by the res re return results. Since this is a, Qu a Quarkus app, a service using the REST easy endpoint, it's easily started with this and we can run it locally here. And that's it. Now this endpoint is up and running. We can go ahead and set it aside. Now let's go ahead and start our controlled cluster demo, running it locally inside the IDE uh, endpoint. You can see it's getting started. And as expected, the primary cluster is where these messages are going. Now again, this should continue for approximately 20 messages, uh, the probe is every 20 seconds. Uh, so that's how many times it takes for us to get or every second. So it should take approximately 20 seconds, which is the rate we're publishing messages. And there, just like clockwork, we hit that endpoint and returned this different URL. And now you can see it automatically switched over to this Kubernetes cluster in the 192 namespace. And there's no longer messages going there. So we completely rerouted the traffic from the client over to this new server. Uh, with no code changes whatsoever. It was controlled by the value returned by that HTTP endpoint service. This is going to continue for a little bit. And then we can see we've switched back. And now from this point forward, messages, and you can see here we, we didn't lose any messages. Message 49 showed up and we left off at 48. So again, zero message loss. They were rerouted. During that transient time, it was switching over. The messages were queued, and so there aren't any issues, and it's going to continue to operate like So in summary, we've seen that the release 2.10 of Pulsar includes two new failover clients that provide continuous availability for your Pulsar applications. I demonstrated how to configure and use both the automatic failover client when producing messages and the controlled failover client when using messages. The controlled failover client is harder to implement because it requires an additional service to be written but it does provide more flexibility to you and your administrators. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to attend this session and feel free to scan the QR code shown here to learn more about Apache Pulsar, download available multiple resource links, including a free copy of my book. And don't forget to explore the code in the GitHub repo shown here again. It's been a pleasure speaking to all of you. Let's please keep in touch. You can find my social media uh, contact information here, my Twitter handle, you can find me on LinkedIn. And again, you can explore all the code in my uh, publicly available GitHub repo. Lots of examples, not only for this one, but other talks of uh, complete source code for the Apache Pulsar, uh, Pulsar in Action book available by Manning Press and many more resources available. Thank you very much and have a great conference.